In the 1930s, a Canadian dentist, Weston A. Price, was considering the root cause of dental problems. No era in the long journey of mankind reveals in the skeletal remains such a terrible degeneration of teeth and bones as this brief modern period records. And it wasn't just the deterioration of dental health that Price was taken by, but also the rise of chronic disease, both physical and mental. After spending several years approaching this problem by both clinical and laboratory research methods, I interpreted the accumulating evidence as strongly indicating the absence of some essential factors from our modern program, rather than the presence of injurious factors. Instead of the customary procedure of analysing the expressions of degeneration, a search has been made for groups to be used as controls who are largely free from these affections. Price travelled all around the world, visiting indigenous populations who had not been exposed to the modern Western diet and lifestyle. He detailed his observations in Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, a comparison of primitive and modern diets and their effects. The images and quotes from Price I'm giving are from this book. In the indigenous groups that Price visited across five continents, he observed that, even though they didn't use toothbrushes, they tended to have straight, well-formed and healthy teeth, largely free from tooth decay. Associated with a fine physical condition, the isolated primitive groups have a high level of immunity to many of our modern degenerative processes, including tuberculosis, arthritis, heart disease, and affections of the internal organs. So what did Price think was protecting them from these problems? The origin of this protective factor is provided in nutrition and is directly related to the mineral content of the foods and to known and unknown vitamins, particularly the fat soluble. An essential characteristic of the successful dietary programs of primitive races has been found to relate to a liberal source of the fat-soluble activator group. In other words, a high intake of the fat-soluble vitamins D3, K2 and retinol, which is the activated form of vitamin A. Retinol is key for your immune system, the health of your eyes, the health of any membrane or barrier in your body, including your skin reproductive health, and the development of a baby during pregnancy. Vitamin D has been thrust into the limelight with the recognition of its role in immunity and reducing the severity of infectious diseases, including COVID, along with risk reduction for multiple chronic conditions. Vitamin K2 reduces cardiovascular disease risk, and in conjunction with retinol and vitamin D3, is crucial for the health of your bones and teeth. Price analysed the foods in the diets of the indigenous groups he visited, finding a similar picture in every group. Compared to the modern Western diet, indigenous diets contained much higher quantities of minerals like calcium, phosphorus, iron, magnesium, copper, and iodine, and in each case at least 10 times the quantity of fat-soluble vitamins. I have shown that the primitive races studied were dependent upon one of three sources for some of these fat-soluble factors, namely seafoods, organs of animals, or dairy products. These are all of animal origin. It is significant that I have, as yet, found no group that was building and maintaining good bodies exclusively on plant foods. A number of groups are endeavouring to do so with marked evidence of failure. Price was aware that in the Western diet, nutrient-dense whole foods were being replaced with nutrient-poor processed foods, which he describes as the displacing nutrition of commerce, consisting largely of white flour products, sugar, polished rice, jams, canned goods, and vegetable fats. The problem is not so simple as merely cutting down or eliminating sugars and white flour, though this is exceedingly important. The 1930s turned out to be good timing for Price's observations because he was encountering a lot of indigenous groups at the very point that they were acquiring processed Western foods for the first time. He could therefore contrast those still eating their traditional diets with those in the same population who had adopted a Western diet. The most obvious and rapid problem to arise was that of tooth decay. This was followed by the emergence of various chronic diseases. I have shown that in many of these primitive racial stocks, there occurs in the first generation after the displacement of native foods by imported foods, a marked change in facial and dental arch forms. A lack of fat-soluble vitamins in childhood can impact the development of the facial bones. This can contribute to an underdeveloped jaw and subsequently the overcrowding of teeth. Price observed that the narrowing of the face and nose that followed led to problems breathing through the nose, resulting in mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is bad for health. My video on this is linked in the description. The development of the bones around the eyes can also be affected, which may lead to visual problems like astigmatism and short-sightedness. 
a definite lowering in their resistance to the modern degenerative processes has taken place. To illustrate the narrowing of the facial and dental arch forms of the children of the modernized parents after they had adopted the white man's food was accompanied by an increase in susceptibility to pulmonary tuberculosis. It is important to emphasize in connection with the development of the deformities of the face that other skeletal deficiencies or abnormalities result from the same disturbing factors. One of these is the narrowing of the entire body with a tendency to increase in height. This is shown in many of the family groups of modernized primitives. The effect of this narrowing of the body, which in girls results in the boyish type of figure due to the narrowing of the hips, introduces an entirely new and serious problem in the experience of our modern civilization when confronted with the problems of childbirth. Price outlined his view that poor nutrition in young girls can decrease the ease and efficiency of their future pregnancies. Among primitive races living in a primitive state, childbirth was a very simple and rapid process, accompanied by little fear or apprehension. Whereas, in the modernized descendants, even in the first and second generations of those individuals born to parents after they had adopted the foods of modern white civilizations, serious trouble was often experienced. Given the huge increase in C-section rates over the last few decades, we should really be trying to figure out what is going on with childbirth, something I'll be covering in future videos. Still another problem confronts us. The sources of fat-soluble activators indicated above, namely dairy products, organs of animals, and seafoods, may vary through a wide range in their content of the fat-soluble activators or vitamins, depending upon the nutrition available for the animals. Unfortunately, milk may have a high cream line or butter fat content and still be low in essential fat-soluble vitamins due to the inadequacy of the food given the cows. In other words, you can use poor quality grain to fatten up animals, as is the practice so often in modern intensive farming, but then that animal will not necessarily provide you with sufficient micronutrients. Unless hay is carefully dried so as to retain its chlorophyll, which is a precursor of vitamin A, the cow cannot synthesize the fat-soluble vitamins. Price noted that animals eating fresh, fast-growing vegetation produced the most retinol. It's the same for K2, with animals needing access to proper vegetation full of K1 so that they can convert it to K2. The nutrition of animal foods is only as good as the nutrition and lifestyle of the animal providing it. And supplements may also be inadequate when it comes to optimal human nutrition. In connection with the vitamins, it should be kept in mind that our knowledge of these unique organic catalysts is limited. This is most certainly still the case today. Clearly, it is not possible to undertake to provide an adequate nutrition simply by reinforcing the diet with a few synthetic products which are known to represent certain of these nutritional factors. Price goes on to document problems with calcium and vitamin D supplements causing calcification when taken in pregnancy. Vitamin D may get calcium into your blood, but you don't really want it there. You want it in your bones and teeth. Elsewhere, calcium can cause havoc Calcification is one of the very common pathological mechanisms of disease. For example, calcification of blood vessels is involved in cardiovascular disease, which is why studies like this one can conclude that calcium supplements with or without vitamin D modestly increase the risk of cardiovascular events, especially heart attacks. These results have not always been replicated in other studies, but the reason for the observation in this study is very plausible. Vitamin K2 seems to be needed in the picture to stop the problem with calcification and instead put the calcium into the right place, i.e. the bones and teeth. That is why vitamin K2 both reduces cardiovascular disease risk and helps prevent osteoporosis. In Japan, vitamin K2 has been used in the treatment of osteoporosis for decades, whereas here in the UK, calcium and vitamin D alone are used. And even if we add K2 supplementation into the mix, there will always be a further level of complexity to whole foods that we do not yet understand. Nature has put these foods up in packages containing the combinations of minerals and other factors that are essential for nourishing the various organs. A supplement is not the same as food and may not give the same results. This strongly emphasizes the great desirability of using nature's natural foods instead of modern synthetic substitutes. It seems like modern nutrition is only just now catching up with price on this one. Advances in nutrition science have demonstrated that foods represent complex matrices of nutrients, minerals, bioactivators, food structures, and other factors, e.g. phospholipids, prebiotics, probiotics, with correspondingly complex effects on health and disease. 
There are two programs now available for meeting the dental caries problem. One is to know first in detail all the physical and chemical factors involved and then proceed. The other is to know how to prevent the disease as the primitives have shown and then proceed. The former is largely the practice of the moderns. The latter is the program suggested by these investigations.